Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining a Pivot and Focus Meetup. Today's program will address the psychology of empathy, connection, and storytelling. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. On the right side of your screen, you will see a GoToWebinar sidebar. You can click on the orange arrow to expand or minimize the side panel. Questions are encouraged and will be addressed at the end of today's program. So please type your question into the question box and click send to submit. CPSMs attending this live program will automatically receive 0.5 CEUs added to their online transcript. Finally, today's program is being recorded and will be posted on the Pivot and Focus page within SMPS. Our presenter today is John Robert Tartaglioni. John Robert is a psychologist psychologist, behavioral scientist, and the founder and CEO of Influence 51, a boutique consulting firm that helps clients leverage insights from psychology to build more effective marketing, branding, sales, business development, and communication strategies. He received his master's degree from the University of Chicago and University College London, and will be pursuing his PhD at the University of Cambridge this fall. John Robert, welcome to the program. The audience is all yours. Thank you for having me, Marcy, uh, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I, will, I will begin with a bit of an admission. Um, I am not dressed nearly as well as I am in that picture that you see on your screen. Um, it's been a lot of sweatshirts and sweatpants for me, as I'm sure many of you as well, um, but I'm happy you can all attend. Uh, we're gonna talk today a bit about the psychology of empathy, connection, and storytelling. And I'm going to jump right in with a story of my own. A little over 40 years ago, there was a young boy who was born in Kenya. His name was Kameli. He was born into a village that had no heat or air conditioning, no electricity, and no running water. And although his town was very small, Kameli had very big dreams. Most importantly of all, he wanted to help people. He dreamed of becoming a doctor. So he studied hard, he worked hard, and at a little after the age of 20 years old, he received one of the best letters of his life. It was an acceptance letter to a medical school in New York City. And so Kameli, now a young man, as you see pictured on your screen, ventured off to America, being the first of his tribe to leave the village and go to the United States. When he arrived in New York City, he fell in love with it. He was blown away by the size of the buildings, the sheer number of the people, the technology at his fingertips. He grew to see New York as a home away from home, which made it all the harder for Camelli when on September 11th, 2001, he witnessed this. The planes that crashed into the World Trade Center, devastating America, and thousands of families, both here and around the world. Kameli, unfortunately, was not able to seek refuge with his family. In fact, he wasn't able to return to Kenya for months after the September 11 attacks. When he finally did return, he was met with open arms. His tribe, the Maasai people, welcomed him back and were excited to hear all about his travels and all about New York City. And so Kameli sat down with them and he spoke about the people, the technology. He spoke about the buildings that literally stretched into the clouds, things that the Maasai people couldn't fathom living in their small village. But then Kameli got to the Saturnus and he let them know about the events that took place on September 11th, events that they were completely unaware of because they didn't have access to any of the news that was reporting on it. And the Maasai people were absolutely devastated. They couldn't fathom the sadness that families must be going through and it broke their hearts. Although none of them had met any New Yorkers, they knew they needed to do something. And so the village elders got together and they decided to give the most precious gift that they could think of. They donated 14 cows to the people of New York. Now, I understand many people hearing this right now might sound a little bit laughable. 14 cows, what material benefit 
is that going to provide to the people of New York? But for the Maasai people, cows were considered sacred. They were quite literally the most precious thing they had outside of their own children. And so the donation of 14 cows was an incredibly meaningful gesture. And once the people of New York realized how meaningful it was, how selfless of an act the Maasai people had, had bestowed upon them, it started getting picked up around the world. Outlets like the New York Times and BBC News reported on the generosity of the Maasai people. People were so touched in New York that they started opening up charities that were geared towards benefiting the Maasai and their children. And people even wrote books, children's books, about how to be like a Maasai warrior, how to conduct yourself like the people of the Maasai tribe. And so just like that, based on their response during a crisis, the Maasai went from being a relatively unknown tribe in a small part of Kenya to being world known for their generosity and their selflessness. The reason I start off with the story about the Maasai people is to help you understand the importance of this juncture. Because just like the Maasai people's response to the 9-11 tragedy defined them on a worldwide stage, I want everyone on this call to understand that how you react now has the potential to define your brand for a very long time. I've been working with some executives across industries over the past few weeks, doing some coaching with them. And the way I've been explaining this crisis is I've told them to think of COVID-19 like a very bad snowstorm. And the reason I say to think of it like a very bad snowstorm is whenever a very bad snowstorm hits, there are two types of people that come out of the woodwork. There's one type of person that sees them as an opportunity to make money, right? Some people come out and they start selling shovels for very high markups. But there's another type of person that comes out too. The type of person that instead of selling shovels, picks up their own shovel and goes and helps their neighbors. These are the two routes that people take during the snowstorm. Now, while the individual who tries to sell shovels might make short-term profits, the long-term repercussions on their reputation can be very damaging indeed. Meanwhile, the individuals that pick up the shovels and go and help their neighbors end up having very, very good long-term benefits. And the reason is because situations like this, crises, times of crisis, provide people with the rare opportunity to do well by doing good. And the reason for that has to do with this idea of reciprocity, okay? Reciprocity or the compulsion to give back to someone when they have given to you is quite literally hardwired into our brain. And there are many organizations that understand this on an intuitive level. If you traveled in airports during the 70s and 80s, chances are you probably ran into someone that looked like this at some point, okay? These people are Hare Krishnas, and they would frequent airports in the 70s and 80s, and they had a very interesting tactic. They would approach travelers with a flower, and they would offer to hand them the flower, they'd extend their hand, and they'd smile and encourage you to take it. And once you took the flower, they would then say, would you mind giving us a donation to help our organization? And what happened is, once people accepted the gift of the flower, whether they wanted it or not, they felt compelled to provide a donation. Because when someone gives you something, you feel compelled to give something back right? And organizations, savvy organizations, have taken notice of this human compulsion. There are now charities and nonprofits out there that take this tactic to another level. They will actually send you requests for donation in the mail, and they will include a small amount of money with their request. Because they have found that even though they're losing 50 cents or a dollar per envelope they send out with that cash included in it, the people who receive those envelopes are exponentially more likely to donate themselves because they have been giving, given something 
and thus they want to give something back in return. So these charities and nonprofits end up making a net profit. The conclusion here is that it can be said that when we give, we also earn. When we give to others, when we give selflessly, especially in times like this, we earn respect, we earn a good reputation, and ultimately we earn an indebtedness, a sense of gratitude and wanting to give back to us. Now, when I say this, sometimes over the past few weeks, I've gotten this reaction, which is understandable, right? Where people say, listen, our company's in a crisis. We're kind of on life support. We can't afford to give away anything right now. And my response is, you need to broaden your idea of what giving is, okay? Giving need not be material. When I say give something, I mean there are plenty of low to no cost gestures that you can give that will yield tremendous return on investment in terms of the emotional impact they'll have, right? Things like sending a video from your company to another company, right? just to lift their spirits, just to say that we're thinking of you. Things like helping other organizations to help their people, help their communities, right? Compiling a list of resources and sending it out about loans, about assistance, about safety, about precautions. These things don't have to be business centric. It's just a way of lending a hand to a neighbor. Phone call check-ins, right? Things where you don't actually try to sell to these prospective clients, but you just call to check in and see how they're doing. See if there's anything you can do to help. And of course, free advice. Advice is one of these beautiful things where it's a non-zero sum investment, right? The people who get the advice are gaining more than you are losing. And so these are some of the ways that you can give to people. And by doing so, you're able to establish this emotional connection, right? So I want you to take a lesson from modern advertising. Anyone who watched the Super Bowl this year or in any year past over the past decade realizes that advertisers are no longer interested in talking about the traits and the characteristics of their products. That's not the game anymore. The Doritos doesn't get on and say, hey, our chips are crunchy and flavorful and cost effective. That's not how it works. They put a celebrity on the screen, someone you're familiar with, doing something funny or memorable, because what they wanna do is not win your mind, but win your heart, because they know in the long run, the most important thing they can do is create a positive association between their brand and you. And by doing these gestures, by giving, by picking up a shovel per se, and going to help your neighbor during these times, you get the most important thing for a marketer and an advertiser, and that's a positive association with potential audiences. The second thing I want to talk about today is this idea of connection, because connection is something that sometimes we take for granted, and obviously many of us are experiencing true disconnection for the first time over these past few weeks. But I want to take you back to the early 1990s. On a college campus somewhere in the Midwest, a young man by the name of Kip is sitting on the main quad and he's talking with one of his friends when all of a sudden a Frisbee lands right next to him. Kip picks up the Frisbee, stands up, and looks around to see who threw it. When he finds the two people that have thrown the Frisbee, he throws it back to them with a smile. A man catches it, smiles at him, and says, hey, thanks so much, and throws it back to Kip. Kip's smile gets even bigger. He thinks he's about to be part of the Frisbee game. And so he throws the Frisbee back to the two gentlemen. And to his dismay, they start throwing it back and forth between each other, ignoring Kip. So Kip is left standing there, feeling rejected, feeling excluded. And he remembers thinking to himself how stupid he felt standing there with a big smile on his face, thinking he was about to be part of this Frisbee toss. And now all of a sudden, they're just tossing it back and forth to themselves. Fortunately for us, Kip just happened to be a young budding psychologist. And he decided to investigate this feeling that he got, this really negative feeling of rejection, being excluded from something as trivial as Frisbee. And so he designed a paradigm called Cyberball. Cyberball is really, really simple. And you can see a screenshot 
of a cyberball game right in front of you now. Essentially how cyberball works is people come into a room and are told that they are assigned to either player one, two, or three. And they're told that there are two other people in two other rooms that are controlling the other avatars. Now, unbeknownst to the participants, the two other avatars actually aren't being controlled by other people. They're computer simulations. And what the program is designed to do is it's designed to share equitably with all three players for the first 30 seconds and then to exclude the actual participant for the remainder of the game thereby replicating this feeling of rejection that Kit felt years earlier. Now what happened from Cyberball is when people played Cyberball, Kipling Williams and his partners, Eisenberger and Lieberman, put people in fMRI machines. They were scanning their brains while they played this game. And what they found was one of the most profound findings from neuroscience over the past 20 years. They realized that when people were socially excluded from something as trivial as Cyberball, the areas of the brain that lit up overlap significantly with the areas of the brain that light up when we experience physical pain. Quite literally, social isolation, social exclusion hurts, okay? And this is why companies, organizations need to take social connection and social connectedness seriously. We now know that social pain is very real and the repercussions of feeling social disconnection are widespread and very serious. These include things like cognitive deficits, right? People who are induced to feel as if they're being excluded perform more poorly on GRE style tests. People that are feeling social disconnection are less motivated, okay? They're less likely to stand up to challenges and they exhibit poor health habits. They're less likely to exercise and they're also less likely to eat healthy foods. And finally, they're far more susceptible to groupthink. When you're feeling disconnected, you're less likely to feel confident enough to stand up to the group. You're much more likely to just relent and succumb to this idea of groupthink, which kills organizations slowly and silently from the inside. And so one of the things we really need to focus on, which many of you are probably aware of at this point, is how do we foster connection from a distance, right? And so the most simple way, of course, that I hope many of you are doing already, is to video chat as much as possible, right? Try to stay connected with your teams face-to-face -face as much as you possibly can. But I also want you to understand that people don't derive the social capital from working at an organization simply from being face-to-face -face in meetings, right? It's about being together throughout the day. And so I want you to also concentrate on trying to create spaces for hanging out during work hours that aren't dedicated to meetings, right? Inviting people to just have lunch with you, right? Or work side by side, quote unquote, as if you were in an office together, okay? Trying to replicate this office feeling. Similarly, you can do things like activities with one another, trying to fill that hole that's left when people don't have social outlets. Things like inviting teams to happy hours, okay? Pulling the group on new hobbies that you could learn together starting book clubs, and my favorite, which one of my friend's companies just started doing, is once a week, they started having a team dinner where they would all pick a recipe and cook it at the same time. And in this way, they would actually share an experience together. Even though they couldn't be in the same room, they could share the same smells, they could share the same taste, and they could share each other's company. The third thing I want to speak about today is empathy. Now, I was planning on explaining empathy myself, but my girlfriend reminded me that when I explain things like empathy, I tend to get into a little bit of boring technical jargon. And so I've opted instead to allow an expert in the field, Brene Brown, to explain empathy on my behalf. So I'm going to show a short video now and just have you listen. <sighs> So what is empathy and why is it? What is that reference? Piece of fruit. No worries. Empathy. It's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions 
very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think that empathy is kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, oh, it's bad, uh-huh. Sympathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, can past response begin with us. I had it, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone shares something with us, it's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as well. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Okay. Now, I'm not sure how, how, I hope you guys can hear that, but if you couldn't hear that, I encourage you to look up Renee Brown on Empathy on YouTube. It's a very short video. It's, it's really informative, right? But the reason I bring up empathy right now is because businesses, by and large, are not used to creating empathic messages, right? A lot of our marketing and our advertising isn't based on empathy. It's based on utility. But now businesses really need to start thinking about how to create empathic communication and empathic messaging. Because if they do not, they run the risk of coming off as tone deaf, right? A lot of us have heard this commentary in the news with some of the advertisements and messages that have gone out over the past few years. Whenever you hear that someone's messaging is tone deaf, chances are it means they lacked empathy when they were creating it, right? They didn't understand what people needed and how they felt or how they would feel when they heard the messaging. I see that happening a lot of times over the past few weeks, right? Where you have business owners that are reeling, okay? Their businesses are crumbling around them. They've had to lay off people that they care about. They have workers and employees that are coming to them and saying, I can't feed my family. Or worse yet, they have loved ones who are being lost to this disease. And I can't tell you the number of companies that have come to organizational owners like that and said, hey, if you do business with us now, we can give you 5% off. And they don't understand that that is the organizational equivalent of saying, hey, want to bite a sandwich? Like that antelope did in the video, right? It's a tone deaf response. And so businesses need to start thinking more like politicians, okay? Politicians are very, very familiar with crafting empathic messages. It's what a lot of them spend thousands upon thousands of dollars on focus groups for. What they're trying to do is they're trying to understand what is most important to people and what emotions are they experiencing right now when they talk about those issues. Because what politicians ultimately want to do is they want to echo those emotions back to them. They want to say, I know how you're feeling. I know you're feeling angry. I know you're feeling sad. And in this way, constituents look and say, that person gets me, right? And that's how businesses need to start thinking too. When they're communicating with clients now, it's no longer for the foreseeable future just about utility, just about what we can provide, but understanding how you are feeling 
and helping you recognize how working with us might be able to improve that situation. Now, the other type of empathic messaging is not external, but rather internal, right? When you're talking with your people, and when you're creating communications for your people during a time like this, there are three critical components that you need to convey. The first one is that you recognize what they're going through, right? For better or worse, we're all in this together. And so you need to be able to summarize the situation, speak about what you're experiencing, what you're hearing, and lay out the facts, particularly the obstacles and challenges, okay? There's no use in ignoring these. We all know they're there, and pretending they're not creates more anxiety. The second thing you need to convey is that you know how they're feeling, right? Making statements like, if you're like me, or I know I'm feeling this way, and I imagine you are too, right? Being honest and being a little bit vulnerable, I know that can be scary, but it can actually be comforting for people to know that their leaders are feeling vulnerability at this time as well. But it's important to couple that vulnerability with a plan, right? To lay out a clear roadmap for people. But more important than a plan, okay, is enlisting your people's help to make that plan final, to make that plan better. Because what happens is, People are more likely to support and believe in a plan when they help to create it, right? And so it's important for us as leaders to lay out a roadmap, but we also want to give them an opportunity to help contribute to that roadmap as well. And the reason why creating empathic messaging is so critical when you're talking to your people over the next few weeks is because employees are rarely loyal to companies. They become loyal to the people who happen to work in the companies. And that's a really critical distinction. And so by communicating well and communicating with empathy over the next few weeks, you can actually cultivate loyalty that will last long after this crisis. The final thing I want to talk about today is how we tell stories, right? If you've been part of my workshop before, you understand the importance of storytelling. You recognize that humans crave a good story. But I found over the past few weeks that especially in times of crisis, leaders are not telling the right story, right? Some of the coaching clients I've been working with, when I ask them to tell me a story that will inspire me, tell me a story that will motivate me, they tell me a story of success which is great, talking about stuff is important, but they don't talk about the struggles that went into achieving that success. And I try to explain to them that telling a story of success without going into the struggles that helped you get to that success is like starting a Rocky movie 85 minutes in, right? If you start a Rocky movie 85 minutes in and you just see Sylvester Stallone in his triumph, People don't resonate with that, right? That's not inspiring. That's not motivating. What's universally motivating about movies like Rocky is seeing him get beat up, him get punched, him fall down, and continue to get back up. What inspires people is not leaders who have found success without challenge. What inspires people is leaders with stories of falling and failing and continuing to get back up in spite of that and succeeding. And so it's important during times like this when everyone's feeling vulnerable to lean into this vulnerability and turn it into a strength. The last thing I want to talk about is helping to remind people who they're working for, right? Who are they doing this for? Who's counting on you? There was a study done about 10 years ago where they went into a call center that made calls daily trying to solicit donations for charities. And they randomly divided the call center employees into two groups. One group, before the start of their shift, was read from the employee handbook. Really boring stuff about just what they should be doing on calls and the type of script that they should be reading from. The other group was told stories about the people that benefit from their work. 
They were told stories about the people that receive the donations that they solicit and how it improves their lives and how grateful they are for the work that they do. And what they found was that the group that heard the stories of the people that they were helping were 45% more productive that day than the group that was just read from the handbook. And what's even more impressive is they came back a week later and they found that that group who had been read the inspiring stories was still more productive than the group that had been read the handbook. It's important to understand who you're doing this work for beyond yourself. Parents have a really easy time understanding this. Parents become demotivated. Parents become depressed sometimes. Parents don't feel like going to work. But when they look at their child, they realize that that's an individual who's counting on them. And that's all the motivation someone needs, to understand who's counting on them. And so it's important as you go back to your people to share not only why their work will benefit the business, but who will it benefit beyond the business, right? If you're creating buildings, if you're designing buildings, talk about the students that will learn in those schools. Talk about the people that will be cured in those hospitals. These are the things that motivate people to keep pushing through when they don't feel like it anymore. So the last thing I'll say is that good leaders inspire people by telling stories of their own triumphs. But great leaders inspire people by telling stories of challenges that lay ahead and positioning their people as the heroes that will write the final chapter. And so I encourage you to go back and explain to your people who they're doing this for and let them know the heroes that they are for continuing to do this work. And so I'm going to end there. I'm going to say thank you for your time. We're going to jump into questions in a moment, but I also want to take this opportunity while I have you guys to let you know that I influence 51 wants to help as much as we can during this time too. And so if there's anyone on this call that has lost their job, that has been laid off, I'm offering free coaching services for anyone in that position right now. Um, and similarly, if there are companies interested in learning how they might be able to use our work, uh, we'll, we'll do it for free or pay, pay what you can. And so, Marcy, I'm going to turn it back to you, um, and, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions people have. Great. Thank you, John Robert. Um, now it's time for the Q&A portion, and we will accept questions. Thank you for that offer. Uh, please, if you would like to take John Robert up on his offer, feel free to put that information in the chat box. It only comes to us as the organizers of this program. Please feel free to ask any questions. Our first question is, will the presentation be shared? And the answer is yes. Following the program, you will get a PDF of the slides as well as the recording, and all of that will live on our smps.org slash pivot and focus page. So I'll jump in with um, our first question. So obviously, as marketing and big development professionals, we still need to conduct business. How do we do this properly without coming across to death? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, right? Because, I mean, I, you know, in an ideal world, we want to be able to, um, you know, just lend a helping hand and do so for free. But I understand that we're running businesses here, you know, we're, we're contributing to businesses that are probably struggling themselves, and you guys need to continue trying to make money as well. But what I really want to get across in this this section on empathic messaging and empathy, right, is that the way in which you approach clients needs to change, right? It's no longer just about emailing them or giving a phone call and telling them about all the great things that you have to offer, your company has to offer. You need to first prove to them that you understand what they're dealing with, right? You need to prove to them that you recognize the emotions that they're going through and the situations that they're being put in and that you're making an effort to bend as much as you can 
to help them out during these circumstances, right? And so we do need to cre continue creating marketing messages. I totally understand that. But the marketing messages can't just jump right into the utility of our offering. They need to start off with recognizing and proving that you recognize the situation that the client is in and asking them how you might be able to help, right? And so the process, the marketing process, might be expanded a bit more. Okay? It's no longer a single email. It now might be a few emails sequentially to try to understand where they're at and then figure out what you can offer that won't come off. Thank you for that. Uh, another question. Sometimes the nice video or email is perceived as taking advantage of a tra tragedy to get recognized. How can we prevent that? Yeah, so um, I think the, the nice video or email um, can come off as taking advantage if it's followed either in that email or very shortly after with an offer, right? And so obviously, you know, people think it's manipulative if you send an email saying, how can I help? We really care about you. And then, you know, a, a day later, you know, or a few hours later, you send, hey, how about 5% off our services, right? And so I encourage individuals who are listening on this call to figure out the people and the companies that they want to sell to and the people that they just want to extend a hand to right now. Um, I think the safest bet is to separate those two individuals because you're absolutely correct that doing this in a hand-fisted way comes off as manipulative. And so you need to make a decision if it's going to be just offering help, just offering services, just offering you know, a, a listening ear, then you need to stick with that strategy for at least a week or two, right? It can't just be a day of listening and then a day of, of making a pitch. Um, and, and so I would separate the clients that you want to continue just making offers to and continue just trying to get their business with the clients that you see as kind of long-term type prospects that you want to develop a relationship with and reap the rewards of that relationship later on down the road when this has subsided. Okay, another question here. Should individuals in the company or the corporate account make social media posts with these empathetic messages? I think, I say yes, but I say a tentative yes. Um, and I say a tentative yes because you don't want these empathetic messages to come off like a campaign, right? Um, you want them to come off as organic. You want them to come off as, as a, a little bit spontaneous. And so I, I caution organizations from saying, hey, today everyone send out a message about this, or today everyone send out a message about that. You can encourage your people to reach out to, you know, the clients that they have a personal relationship with, ask them how they're doing, to, you know, put messages on social media if they're feeling organically compelled to do so. I just want people to know that inauthentic empathy is often worse than manipulation. And so if you're not feeling it, I would caution you not to pretend like you are. All right, thank you for that. Um, so one last question. Any sure. tips on showing empathy to folks who are anxious or um, even, quote unquote, the Debbie Downers? Uh, do you have some tips on how to help with that? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. Um, so, so empathy is all about so, so let me go into the, the boring explanation really quick. So empathy comes from a German word that literally means feeling into, right? So empathy is quite literally feeling or experiencing the world as another person. And so when politicians, for instance, do research on how people are feeling, they do it because they want to do what's called emotion matching. And so if you know that some of your people are anxious right now, right, or they're depressed, I encourage you 
to do some emotion matching with them, to call them up personally and say, hey, I know you're feeling anxious and I'm feeling a little anxious too and I wanna just talk through it with you. Now, the one thing in terms of a tip that I would give is oftentimes people who are quote unquote Deb Debbie Downers, I think it was worded, right? A lot of times these people don't want help from others, right? They want sympathy from others. And so what I would say is I would say lean into that, call them up, give them sympathy. But the recommendation I would give is when you feel as if you're creating a connection with them, pose to them, when is the last time you felt like this? And what did you do to successfully get yourself out of it, right? Because oftentimes it's actually people themselves who are more persuasive, right? Who can be motivated more by what they've done in the past than what someone is suggesting that they do. And so try to help them recall times when they felt anxious, when they felt depressed, when they felt scared, and what has helped them in the past and help them lean on that to help them during situations like this, right? So let them kind of do their own brainstorming, if you will, rather than just bombarding them with suggestions. Well, thank you for that. Um, and John Robert, thank you for your presentation today. On behalf of SNPS, um, we'd like to thank everyone who participated. Uh, following today's meetup, you will receive a link to complete a brief survey of the session. The feedback is extremely important to us and helps us plan future programs. John Robert, do you have any closing sentiments? I just, uh, I, I really want to thank you guys for tuning in. Um, you know, I know this is a genuinely challenging situation for many of us on here. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I hope, you know, uh, anything that I've, I've given today might resonate a little bit, might provide you with, with you know, uh, one more small tool that you can go and, and, and use during your, your day-to-day -day work. And um, aside from that, uh, you know, I, I think we just, uh, we just need to lean on each other at times like this and know that um, th there is an end, even if we can't see it yet. Thank you for that. Well, again, on behalf of SNPS, thank you to our presenter, John Robert, and everyone who has participated. This is the end of our program. You may now disconnect.